There's five beetles in here. We're probably gonna have to lay them out because they're gonna be hiding. This tree's getting ready to set cones. So it's a beautifully healthy tree. This is the third time it's set cones since 2003. Look at the ovisacs of this compared to the one that you saw earlier. Notice how they're all mowed off and chewed up. We'll set them up under ultraviolet light. You'll be able to see predator activity. Back when I grew up, all the saltine crackers had sawtooth grain beetles in them and they looked just like that at brown. It was raining, these were really wet. If I had put them in here raw, those beetles would be stuck upside down in the bottom and probably be dead in a day. Let me go get my ultraviolet set up and we'll put it in one of the bathrooms and we'll bring a couple people in at a time. If you're worried about your eyes, you can wear eye protection. I've got some UV, but if you're just gonna look for a minute or two, it ain't gonna, if you made it through the 70s and your blacklight posters, you're gonna be all right. Okay. I got my sister to stop spraying um, in the house for wasps. You know, people are terrified of wasps, right? So she was spraying. This stuff here is like pretty good. You know, it's like limonene, which is basically just like citrus oil, and pyrethrins, not so good. Pretty toxic stuff, actually, right? But not as bad as a lot of other stuff. Breaks down pretty quick, but you really don't want to be breathing that in the house. I mean, it could mess with your nervous system in the long run. Um, so I just taught her to, for in the house, just spray those wasps and bees with water. The wings get wet, they fall to the ground, piece of paper in a cup, put them outside, taught all of her friends that. They all stopped spraying poison inside. But we have nests here, and this is an organic farm, and I just find a can laying on the ground where somebody had killed a nest, and it wasn't anything organic. So we just bought a box full of this stuff, Safers, and it's way better than the stuff that they're selling otherwise, you know? It's like... My solution always, if us, like one time they were in the heater, and even though I hit them with diatomaceous over, over and over again, I couldn't wipe them all out. Now, they weren't enough to really be a bother, but one guy that works here is allergic, so he just wasn't happy, you know? And so for that, this probably would have done it, just to make the person comfortable. But mostly, there's some place where I take a hose to them, they just think they have the worst weather in the world. I just give them more bad weather until they decide this really is not a good place. It's time to move somewhere else. Do y'all soil test at all, or is that just like... We soil test, yeah. We so, we're going to soil test this year. We soil and test about... Do you send it into the extension, or...? We tend to send it to A&L because it's faster, and we find now it's way, easier. Waypoint, right? Yeah, waypoint now. It used yeah, to be A&L. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Extension, you have to hit them at the right time, or you wait forever and ever, you know? Mm -hmm. um, we do it with that once in a while with extension, too, just kind of a check, you know, just to see. You get, you, get, you get variations between them all, you know? It's not like they're all exact. I mean, you know... People have their different days, you know, whatever, you know. But Maybe we somehow mess the sample up, I don't know. Phosphorus count, phosphorus count, could the numbers matter that much to you? Or? It matters to me because phosphorus, can, you, you can get way too much and tie up other nutrients, okay. you know. So you're just so, checking that for Yeah, I don't want to go too high. Waypoint would do it, but I don't think NCD, NCDA no. is doing it anymore. They have a lab in North Carolina. Oh, they have a lab Wilson. in North Carolina? Wilson, North Carolina. Uh -huh. So uh, you get... You send it in, actually, they send you a scan of your submission sheet and mm -hmm. everything, and so you get updated. But normally, once they receive the sample, and it takes like two days, it's priority mail. Yeah. Um, normally, I get results back within three business days. Well, there's different ways you can send it, but because we process a lot, I mean, we bought like purpose bags, purpose built bags. I mean, they're just little tiny things, with, I think they're wax lined or something. We use sandwich bags, they work fine. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you fine. want something that's semi-permeable, you mean you don't want it? We just leave a little crack, you know? Yeah, biology will affect the chemical composition. And with as long as it takes from the extension, I'm guessing a lot of things happen. If you send it in the summer, you'll get it back pretty fast. I like the reports better too. Waypoints mm -hmm. reports are easier to interpret, I think. I actually Practical. feel like NCDA made the reports harder to interpret. And Mark Schoenbeck got um, the waypoint people to do a humic matter test that actually mattered, whereas the one from NCDA, it only matters to people spraying herbicide. It's a guide for how to spray herbicide. It's not meant for anything else. And that matters a lot to people like us. We're trying to build the organic matter, humic matter, whatever you want to call it. We want some kind of measurement. The most common one is called loss on ignition, where they basically dry it out, burn it, and then they can tell like a difference in weight, basically, how, what your percent organic matter is. And then there's some like wet chemistry, the other techniques that are a little bit uh, more accurate. You know, I went to the, the OGS conference last weekend, 
to the IPM, um, organic IPM class. Mm -hmm. And I thought this is what I was getting. Mm -hmm. And all they did was go down all of the, every single one of the non, uh, of the organic sprays. sprays. We're actually going to do that too, but probably have a more nuanced take on some stuff, you know, um, and talk about synergies and talk about rotations and talk about but we've already said you got to have your soil in good shape, you know. And in, in the beginning, you know, when I when that part opens up, I'm gonna say the first thing you do is genetics, you know. I mean, if you can get something that's resistant, you're way further along, you know. It makes it a lot easier, you know. And then you just then you use sprays with genetics, you know. And I didn't put it in there, but cultural control for sure. I mean, tomatoes. If I want to grow heirlooms, I grow them under cover, or I don't bother, you know. It's just a waste of time, you know. I mean. Once out, once out of every five years, it's a dry summer and I get great heirlooms, you know? The IPM pyramid kind of, I don't know if you're ever familiar with that term. No, but, I'm stupid. Um, you know, like you start at the bottom. There's things that are like more intense. Mm -hmm. so you go to the top. Sure. Like, you know, pesticides are kind of your last resort. Mm -hmm. And then below that would be like biopesticides, you know, a little bit safer. But down at the very bottom are cultural things like weeding. And, and oil. Airspace. Yeah. I mean, the best fungicide in the world is sunlight, you know? So... And Location, kind of, so you got that air flowing, you're going to reduce your fungi, you know? Well, he was telling us stuff, well, these, these, this, these kill bees. I'm like, then why is it here? And if it kills bees, I'm guessing it kills... I mean, actually, there's things we recommend that, that kill bees. You spray them in the evening when the bees are in. And by morning... Does it kill everything else that's living down there? You spray them carefully in targeted areas to stop outbreaks that you need to really get a grip on or you're going to lose your crop. We don't ever want the nuke if we can get the silver bullet, you know? <laughs> And so now just this past month, this thing I've been on the waiting list for for like two years, which is a new BT Galeria, I think it's called, that works on weevils and beetles, is available. And so I just bought five pounds for 165 bucks. It'll do two acres. It'll last for at least three years. And I was discussing, should I share it with Goldfinch Gardens? Because we don't need that much and we want it fresher. And I wrote to them and said, should I share it, even though it'll keep? And they said, well, this is the heads up. It took us two years to get this. We know they started the next batch, and it failed. So I said, Goldfinch is getting their own, and we're getting our own. We use both spinosa and neem to get control of the vegetable weevil, which in a winter greenhouse, it'll look like at a certain point, somebody walked in with a shotgun and shot all of your vegetables. Just like riddles every, and it can, just, it can make them so they're not even worth harvesting. When is somebody going to start selling the cold-tolerant nematodes? Because the cold tolerant nematodes, which is even better than the silver bullet, because you want the silver bullet is actually a toxin, right? That they've taken from that they produced with a BT bacteria. There's a lot of things they can hit it with if they want less toxic. You, know, you could say, you know, this is how you would do it, pretty much guaranteed. But you might also be, you know, greatly reducing your diversity, which might cause you problems down the road. This is something that may not be quite as guaranteed, but will oh, work. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Gotcha. yeah right. <laughs> they, you know, every Tuesday from 1:40 until people stop asking questions. Talk to Lisa, lisa at livingwebfarms.org. Send both of us an email. Sometimes I won't have the answer, but I got a lot of answers. So the blue is an intact ovisac. So see, that's predator activity. There's an intact ovisac, which is those little blue dots, because that's honeydew that's coming off those little ones there. So it's really cool, because when you don't have these predators, you don't have any of that orange. You know what I mean? It's just all blue. So you're seeing beetle poop. You're probably also seeing larva poop because the ones where these ovisacs are fluffed up, like, you know what I mean, where they kind of look kind of like cotton candy. If there was any egg damage, it would glow bright yellow. And then the other thing that I could do is go in there and squish an adelgid and it'll glow yellow. So let me, let me do something here. I'm just going to take my finger and I'm going to smash right there. Okay. Look what I just did. Now you get that bright blue yep. chartreuse. See how that works? Mm -hmm. Take time-lapse photos, and you could just watch this happen. You know what I mean? Take a picture every hour Interesting. and make, make a movie. Evolve. Right. Mm -hmm. And then we, then we could learn the pattern of predation, because they may start one place. Right. Mm -hmm. And the adelgid itself, the egg, is big and kind of glows green like the moon. I don't know, you know, the greenish moon color. I don't know how else to say it. You can get a pet urine detector. Mm -hmm. I would get a fluorescent one. They show more nuance of color. I can light this up digitally, and it'll still be these colors, but it's real flat, you know what I mean? Because it's more monochrome, because LED is more one wavelength, you know, like a laser. Okay. So this gives a richer 
hue. And the other thing I like about the circular one is you're illuminating all the way around because if you're just coming in at one angle right. and they're at the other angle, you have to move it around and then it'll glow. The other thing is just be careful. I was doing this without protection for a while and I went to my eye doctor and he goes, my God, you're starting to get cataracts. So I just quit and it stopped. But, Too much UV gives you cataracts. Well, and that's, but that was me fearlessly looking yeah. directly into, you know, I mean. Look. Richard, this is true, isn't it? So he finds that, he finds somebody's got a hedge. It's got a good, hedges are great for infestations because oh, you beat the heck out of those hedge fine. hedges, you know? <laughs> right? And okay. you say, you know, manager, you know. That's what I tell him at grandfather, because I got hedges a half a mile long. I will, I will give, I will give you. 50 or 100 Laracobius, you know. The deal is, I get to come back and collect. That's what I did with grandfather, and you know, I mean, they just didn't understand what I was doing. I said, hey, if I put these bugs in here, can I pull them out? And they go, you can take all the bugs you want. Instead and I'm of a like, drug dealer, you're a bug dealer. Exactly, yeah. right. No, I mean, as long as we can make economic sense out of it. Mm -hmm. You can you know, totally. Maybe, I mean, I know there's a little bit more investment upfront, but long term, if we can lower the price to make it Mm -hmm. you know, more cost competitive with other treatments. I, it, I don't see it. You being, find the right, well, the right patch yeah. where you can get them to really multiply and you can, you know, and then and take yourself by the long term view yeah. though too, you yeah. know, like I can spray yeah. oil twice a year from here to eternity. Right, right. Or we'll have to, yeah. We can release beetles yeah. and yes, you're going to pay five X up front, but it's going to serve you for the next pay me now, 50 pay me years. Yeah. Or whatever. And you get to do this crazy light show to people if you mean if you really want to prove it. I've got these portable, powerful. They're yeah, little yeah. Little, yeah. It's a real powerful one, and so you can just go outside, and, you know, and, I, and go look. If I see orange, and I see these disturbed ovisacs, and it, you know, it'd take me ten minutes or less to find a larvae in there. You know what I mean? A lot of people I find get freaked out. Do you talk about thresholds and action levels? You know. If they see any oversacks on their helmet, well, sure. you know, it's like, oh, no. No, you know, we had to uh, try and educate them and be like, no, we had to, levels right. acceptable. We had to untrain everybody at Grandfather because when we first came in there, we were like, if you see one of these little dots, you let us know. We would get phone calls and people had thrown away a Q-tip and it was lodged in a tree. Oh, there's a big Adelgid down by the clubhouse. I'm like, a big Adelgid? What's he talking about? I go down there, you know, and I'm like, okay. So what we did first was we sensitized everybody to it, and then now we had to go, we're sorry, we shouldn't have pumped you up so much on this, because it's the same thing. The other thing that happens, and that we, we will do, because I'm working with all those resorts up and down 105. I'm working with Hound Ears and Twin Rivers and Linville Land Harbor and Grandfather Golf and Country Club. If there's somebody who has a tree in their yard and it's covered with adelgids and they want to spray it, They'll call me up ahead of time and go, come over here and get the beetles off this thing. They know, you know what I mean? That's how, that, they don't even want to spray it. They don't want to spray it, but they will just to make, you know, if it's, a, if it's cosmetics, yeah, mm -hmm. no problem. Yeah. I mean, a certain level of infestation, no problem at all. You know, it's, in fact, it's good because, you know, you got food for the guys that are going to give you control. It's like we were saying earlier about those two. This program touches on everything that we're trying to tell you about operational biology from an introduced pest mm -hmm. to working with uh, Sasaji, which was coming from Japan, to finding our own native predator, which I have permits for. You know, we don't really need to go into that now because once it's in the state, you know, Anybody you can find it. Yeah, man, you know. So let's get it in there. You know what I mean? I'm the great proletarian so entomologist here. These are the other biological controls that we use all the time, okay? Mm -hmm. The BTs, right? Mm -hmm. And Richard, you tell me to say these things. Kurtz, Kurtzka, how do you say it? Kurstaki. It's named after a guy named Kurstak. The type of possible to make on Omega. Kurstaki, that's for Lepidoptera. Okay, that's dry, the Ipel dry flow is probably the most commonly known one. It works for, I mean, some things, I haven't seen it on a label, but I don't understand why it's not. Like, they don't put cutworms on the label. For this one, it's Lepidoptera. Cubworms are worms are a pain in the butt, right? They can really devastate you. One bite, they take, they hit one plant and they're done. It's only the plant that the cutworm's going to hit that happens. I don't know why it's not on the thing, but you know, follow the label. But you know that it does work. Um, Israeliensis, that's Diptera. It works on smaller flies, on mosquitoes. It works on fungus gnats. 
You know, it works on some pretty important pests. Um, it's not going to kill houseflies. There's something else that we should talk about that can kill houseflies. But it works on some things that are a real problem. A couple of brands are so. Mosquito Attack and Skeet Tall. No, you didn't. Oh, did? Frankly, I've never used it first. You know, I, I have had enough problem with those things. And so one time I had a problem with um, fungus gnats. We happen to have nematodes we were using, and they, they work just as well. They're actually probably even better because they can then reproduce in there, and then when you plant them out, there could be nematodes there for the next problem. You know, um, and Richard will, and I will cover nematodes later. San Diego Coleoptera, there isn't any non-GMO version of that anymore, is there? No, the one, okay, well, okay, yeah, San Diego, okay. That was potato beetle. Potato beetle, and then San Diego and the Tenebrianus were the same strain. Mycogen, mycogen pilfered the strain from somebody else went, so when they sequenced it, they turned out to be identical. So mycogen had to lose the San Diego. But, so you can get something that works on potato beetles? Tenebrianus. And I'll tell you what else, that Galeria. Galeria, probably Galeria will probably work on it. That, this guy, you know, the guy that I was talking to, he thought it was very specific to only scarab beetles, chafers, and weevils. He said the other ones didn't have the right sites in their stomachs. No, it hits um, buprestids too. So it would hit emerald ash borer, and I just sent it. I think they did mention emerald ash borer. Yeah, it, it has apple, it has at flat headed apple borer, uh -huh. and one other one. So I sent it to the, my Jamaicans because they have a big problem with coffee borer. This thing might hit coffee borer, be great for them. You know. Right, and ash borer is just getting the silo, and they're all talking about treating the trees. And now that I know this, I can say, this is what you treat them with. You know, you don't need to use all that poison, yeah. you know. Um, so that's a really good thing if you've got a control for ash borer. Um, okay, works on scarab beetles, weevils, and some borers. Check with the manufacturer or check with Richard even better. <laughs> a broader knowledge. Um, for me, the real winner is, as I was saying before we were filming, um, vegetable weevil. Vegetable weevil is the major pest of the winter time. I mean, aphids are going to be a little problem, but basically the major problem is vegetable weevil. And there isn't a really good control because of when it pops out, and this will totally take care of it. We've been having to spray several times with neem, with spinosad, and we kind of get a control, but it means a lot of work. It'll be a whole lot easier just to put the BT down. BT, when, when you have the right BT and the pest that it works for, it's, it's, great. it's like, you know, I try not to use it because I'd rather have beneficials take care of it. There's not a lot of beneficials active in the wintertime, no. you know. So it works. This is our support staff. Yeah, right. Okay, some sources for that stuff, Biocontrol Network, groworganic.com, which is the catalog of Peaceful Valley Farm. That's further away. Fifth season carries a lot of stuff. That's for all the um, BTs probably, except for the, the Galeria. Um, that, that more likely you're only going to get from, maybe from a Rebco, but really the place that I got it from was Green Earth Ag and Turf. That's this little specialty company. And they stayed in touch with the manufacturer, kept track of the people that said they wanted it. Two years later, they finally got it and emailed us. And we just bought it all right away, and now we have it, you know? Neem, it's our only systemic pesticide. And I learned that from Richard. And it's really great. Spider mites or something in a greenhouse, that could be a big deal. You know, you don't want to put them out. You know, it's a hot, dry year. You put them out, you might get in trouble. You just drench this. I mean, you can't do like huge areas because the stuff isn't cheap, but you can do spot treatments and it totally solves it. I've had eggplants, piles of spider mites on the tip of the leaf. Where do we go? What do we do? You know? <laughs> you know? Richard Boylan was the one that was soaking the seedlings at first because we were trying to think of something that would work with transplants. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? And he was like, that's going to give you two weeks protection. I'm like, oh my God, two weeks protection in an organic system? Yeah. I cranked out three, four leaves by then. It's also, it works as an anti feeding It just makes things incredibly bitter, is my understand. And it interferes with the molting process. So it's, it, it functions in many ways. Those are the ideal things to have, things that just mess with the stuff on all kinds of levels, mm -hmm. you know? So it's pretty effective, and we use it. It's expensive. We use it only when we have to, but... It's also an antifungal. That's right. I haven't tried it for that. And rust is what it's supposed to work on, right? And also mildew. Mildew. On powdery and downy. On downy. Anything that works on downy mildew, 
Downy mildew is one of those water molds, same family as late blight and um, the really bad soil ones like for top of the capsici, for top of the cinnamome. I mean, those are just like terrifying, nasty diseases. And if it works on that, that's way important, right. you know. Um, okay, and then once again, same kind of places. You know, they're, they're about the same places. And, you know, I realized I left off. I put it in later, but I just didn't take the time to go back and do it again. A lot of these are available from the better seed companies, you know. So Johnny's, Fedco's, great sources if you're buying anyways. You can just, you know, sometimes save on shipping, you know. Um, a lot of them are available locally, though, at fifth season. That's going to save you a lot of shipping, you know. People know about getting on the Seven Springs Farm Supply mailing list, so you can actually pick it up, and it comes in on a pallet, and the shipping is inconsequential. Those are ways to save money. You know, I threw Harmony Farm Supply in there because they're like Peaceful Valley. Yeah. So this one here, I just was talking to Richard, um, and I was saying, do you think it's worth doing? And he said he thought with the right humidity it would work. And obviously, with the right humidity, fungi take things out. Oh, it's going crazy in there. Yeah. Do you think it's that? It's probably not that, though, right? Uh, it's probably, th there's at least two kinds of fungus in there. Uh -huh. There was a brown one that was on those big aphids that was taking them out and just making them hard. And then there was the splat fungus. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's at least, so one of those probably could have been Bovaria. Uh -huh. The one thing I'm going to tell you guys about Bovaria, we could take any insect from the field, put it in a Petri dish in warm, humid conditions, and they'll come down with Bovaria. I mean, it's just out there. It's like staff on us. Right, it's there. If the conditions are right, it's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that's one I actually haven't tried, but it, what I think I might be interested in trying it on is spotted, um, um, just, uh, oh, yeah, spotted wing drosophila. Spotted wing drosophila. Yeah, because yeah. that's just a, a real pain, and I love my raspberries. You know? <laughs> I just, you know, and I don't like having to pick them not dead ripe. No. I want to touch them and have them fall on my hand. You know? And if I try and do that when spotted wing drosophila is out, they're just writhing with larva. One of the things that's really interesting is I have almost stopped growing raspberries and I'm growing wine berries mm -hmm. because wine berries are Japanese and they come from the same area that the spotted wing drosophila comes from. So when those things, before that berry case opens up, it's got all those glandular trichomes on them and those drosophila get stuck on them. Just like with roadies in the spring, you know, those roadie buds. And so what if we grew a circle of wine berries around our raspberries. That would probably work because you would just need something that would... You know, right, filter them out, yeah, reduce the numbers. My wine berries never even make it into the house. They just go... Uh -huh, right. Okay, so the next one is limonene. Is that how you say it? Limonene. limonene um, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty broad spectrum. It's basically like worse than, you know, more intense than soap, essentially, you know. It just tears things up. If you guys want a cheap source of limonene, I go to uh, Advance Auto, right? Or one of these places, you look around, you can get this stuff and it's actually organic essential oil. I don't think this one's organic, but this is just nothing but citrus oil. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so one thing that it's, that it's recommended for is fire ants and things that work on fire ants are useful. Yeah, oh, it's great cleaner, yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's in it's in the wasp spray that I was talking about, you know. Um, and then, have you ever used the the viral insecticide for coddling moth? Well, I haven't used that, but I'll tell you what I did do is I went. I'm going to tell you right now, the viral thing has gone nuts now. There's viruses. There's a virus for army worm. There's a virus for beet army worm called Spexit. You know what I mean? Is there these and they're, they're companies here in the United States, mm -hmm. and they've and they're all I mean they're all specific viral, and they work good, mm -hmm. but they're very specific. You know what I mean? If you bet you better make sure it's beat army worm or it ain't gonna work. You know I should give it a moment here and mention that you, the best time to spray these things is gonna be when the UV rays aren't strong. Yeah. You know. And in the evening is an excellent time, so you're not impacting any, any bees. Some of these things can affect bees. And it's useful. And also, it's going to be, if you spray it in the evening, it's going to be effective longer because eventually almost all of these are going to break down in UV rays, and you'll have your have longer impact. Also, if you use a spreader sticker, like a good one, like Thermex 70, which is yucca-based, 
that can extend the life a little longer too. And you don't need to have the life for that long. You just need it long enough to knock it back. You don't even want to wipe stuff out. You want eventually to have it be that then you've knocked them back far enough that you, because you had to spray to get, get control, now you can let the beneficials come in and create the balance. You know? So that's important to know. Um, and then, you know, I, don't, I hesitate to even put it on there. I don't like it. I don't like pyganic. I don't like pyrethrins. I think, you know, I think we're going to find out that people who weren't careful are getting some kind of a neural disease down the road, just like we found out about rotenone. Oh, you know? yeah. I think it's just too strong. You know, there's examples of kids using it for hair shampoo that killed their dogs and parrots using it on kids for hair shampoos that killed the kids, you know? And of course, that's massive dope and way too much. But dog person. I mean, I was so glad when they came up with topicals for fleas because mm -hmm. I was up to my elbows in it all the time. Yeah. I think it's just horrible. Yeah. yeah. I don't, you know, so I, had, I still have this much in a container up in CeeLo. I'm never going to use it. Someday I'll find somebody that wants it, you know? Um, we just don't use it. You know, it's just nothing we want. I guess I feel maybe a little better about the safer one because it probably has less, less pyrethrin because it's synergistic with the soap, would you think? So probably a little better, you know? Um, and then um, foliar diseases, first line of defense, genetics, right? Um, I'm not, I'm not going to spend a lot of time because every, every good catalog will tell you this stuff, but boy... You got late blight, you're growing mountain magic tomato not too close to the other heavily infected things, and it's bulletproof. You know, you grow it right next to heavily infected ones, but it still produces. I mean, it looks like crap, and a bunch of them don't look good, but you still get tomatoes. It just, it doesn't want to go down. It is really, you know, and there's supposedly mountain rouge is supposedly out there. And I want mountain rouge, because that supposedly is a mountain magic that's a slicer size. Because the only thing I don't like about Mountain Magic, because it's only this big, you know. Um, and then the other example I have is I have a lot of problem with Circospora, and Ace Beet is really resistant. And so that's the only beet I grow if I don't have it in by now. If I have it in by now, I'd rather grow Early Wonder Tall Top. I like it a lot more. And it'll finish up right as the humidity is coming in, and it'll be fine. But if I wait any longer, and then there are people who don't have a lot of um, doc, which is a, a, um, basically is harboring the disease. It's a vector. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a lot of doc, it's not even an issue. Then you don't have to worry about it. But if it's an issue, I don't even try to control those kind of diseases with sprays. You know, they're just really hard to control with sprays. And I want to eat the leaves. I don't want to spray a bunch of poison on the leaves. You know? So I go with genetics for that because I can. You know? um, also, I didn't put in there, but really major is cultural practices. Make sure you have full sun, space really well. And if you can plant so you're on a hillside, so you got airflow, it'll make a year. 2003, late blight, which I actually wrote for the Express then, and I can't remember what I said, but I said something witty about how heavily everything was molding and how bad the, the funguses were. And that was their lead wrap-up for the, for the year. You know, they quoted me in their wrap-up for the year that quote, because that's how bad the year was, you know? And my tomatoes, I saved with Serenade. I couldn't believe it, but I lost all my big ones. I only got sun golds. And Mountain Air, I didn't spray nearly as much, but there, to the garden, big hill coming down to it, steep hill, then a garden, and then a drop-off wall, about 15 feet or 10 feet or something like that. Not nearly as much blight. Air motion. Right air motion, you know, it just makes a big difference, you know, so those kind of things really matter. The next thing, provide, I really thought I'd have it here, I wanted to have tea brewing, but they didn't, they didn't deliver it yet, it's from a place called Earthfort, which was, I think, founded in conjunction with Elaine Ingham, but I don't think she's connected to them anymore, and they sell this provide, which is a collection of the proper balance of microbial organisms, so you have the proper fungi, fungi and all that, so you make your compost, and maybe it's not as good as you wished it was, right? You soak it in this provide for a couple days with humic acid. I didn't put the humic acid in there because it's not a, you know, a biological product. It's actually, it is a bio, it actually is. Now that I think about it, it's a byproduct from a long time, but yeah. So they do that with humic acid, which feeds it, and then you have really perfect compost tea. I can tell you that when John Nilsson was making compost tea for me back in 2004, I think it was, I was trading for that tea with the, with the CSA, he gave it to me every, every Wednesday night. I'd go home, 
I was spraying up till about quarter of 10. I'm sure my neighbors hated me because of the power sprayer. And in the morning before I left, I sprayed with oxidate. So I kind of cleaned the leaves and I came back and put the tea on. Halfway through the year, the oxidate got pulled. They said it didn't meet and you couldn't use it anymore. They, there had been a mistake, which I wasn't happy about because I had $150 worth of oxidate. But I stopped using it because I followed the rules. And I had a bad case of early blight. It wasn't a late blight year, but early blight was taking everybody's... There's certain years, like it's the right kind of mistiness and grayness, and the early blight can rip you up. And I had it under control completely. By late August, there wasn't another tomato for sale at the market. I had lines. It's the only time I've ever had lines of people to buy my heirloom tomatoes. I, so I, was, I would go to market with stacks. I, had bread, I used to have a bakery, so I had bread racks. They were stacked up to here with tomatoes, and I, was just, and I was selling my seconds for salsa and stuff. You know, people hated it. They were sending people to my stand. You know, no farmer wants to send somebody to another person's stand, but they had to. And I just, I aced it, and then my birthday is September 15th, and I think I'm a weatherman. You know, and I think I understand that there's a big front coming in, and it's going to rain really hard, and I was used to getting frost. I thought, it's going to frost. It's my birthday. I'm not spraying. I'm done. You know, I'm just going to let them go. Didn't frost. I hadn't sprayed. Three days later, early bite took them all out. You know, so I know compost tea can work. Marshall, one time, I did a little trial here with um, charcoal on tomatoes. It was like late in the season. It was well into September. It was a late trial just to see the charcoal impact. And I'm walking to the greenhouse, and I look, and once you've had a lot of late blight, you know what it looks like. And I was looking at dead late blight. And I'm like, wait a minute, did we have a late blight? And Jeremy said, yeah, I was going to spray it. It was looking pretty bad in there. Every bit of it was dead. Marshall had been spraying so much that his tea was kind of crashing, he refed it fish. And Jer John Nilsson thinks he gave it a huge bacterial bloom and, it and it took it out. And I told him to try and redo it the next week. He got about 97% killed. There was a little bit that he missed. It might have been not getting enough spray on, you know. Wow. But by the next year, we couldn't reproduce it. Wow. And so that's the problem. Compost tea can work, but how to get the consistency? And maybe, I haven't tried it yet, but maybe the provide gives us the consistency. Compost tea, tea can be very dynamic. But we still, you know, I just think we're in the infancy. I think, you know, we might be dead by the time it gets figured out. But I think people are going to keep playing with it, and someday it's going to be the solution. The uh, papers that I've reviewed for the tree side of things, it doesn't show much effect at all. See, but I've had people say that, and then I, I look at what they said they did, and it's like, you don't even know what the heck you're doing. Well, I mean, I know that's the problem. I mean, there's so many different custom blends of what, how do you even define aer aerated or non aerated? Right. Well, and then people so. go like, um, well, I didn't feed it because I didn't want to have this happen or something like that. And if you don't feed it, you don't multiply the microbes, so then you're just simply extracting whatever's in your compost. You don't have a high enough concentration. Just like biochar in the infancy, uh, not quite, maybe quite as much, but trying to get the formulas right. Mm -hmm. I know Bartlett mm -hmm. was doing work and, and whatnot, and I, I think the evidence is much stronger. There's a guy named, I don't even know, I can't remember his name, Sherbach or something, but anyway, he did research comparing compost tea, biochar, biosolids, um, compost, straight up compost and mulch. And I think the end point he measured was tree growth. Mm -hmm. um, and it turned out actually in this particular study, which the TCIA ran with and some other organizations, but basically biosolids, believe it or not, was number one um, in terms of both cost, you know, and when you divide that by response, but people, have a hard time stomaching. <laughs> you know, we're using what? Sewage? Yeah, right. So, but uh, other than that, it was then compost, mulch, biochar, you know, those were both very effective. And then area compost tea, actually, I don't think he saw any effect. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was some like commercial product, like some, you know, real high dollar thing that didn't do anything. Right. Either. I actually got involved in a, um, there used to be this thing called Urban Farmer or something, and they had, they had hired somebody to do it a report on compost tea, and he went around and talked to all these people, but he really didn't know anything about compost tea himself. And all these critiques that came in were like totally misunderstanding what compost tea was. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I really have to see exactly what they did, what the compost was. Yeah. You know, there's lots of things like you have to know what you're doing with compost tea for it to work. You yeah. know, there are people that are getting really impressive results, and there are people that are getting nothing. And there are people who have tried it, and because they got nothing once, say it doesn't work. It's not worth the time, you know. I did another, I did a SARE grant, and the conclusion of the person I cooperated on doing it with was, 
It doesn't work because we didn't get our crop. We didn't get our crop because we did a control, because that's what we got told by the extension agent was helping us, that was no treatment at all. So we have this stuff that we're trying to save with compost tea that's got massive amounts of inoculum right next to it. You know? And then we said, so we'll redesign it, ask for an extension, and do it with oxidate as the control. We had two years of drought and warm nights. We literally, the other cooperator, I wasn't going to do it because I figured my neighbors would kill me. He took late blight, closed pinned it to, to tomatoes and watered them all night and couldn't get late, I mean, couldn't get it to happen. You know, he got it from the research station and could not make it happen. So we had to give up on the thing. But I'm convinced we basically totally slowed down. Like, you know, the, the control was gone in two days. And the ones that we hit with compost tea, they lasted for two weeks. But they didn't last for us to get a crop. And he said, well, it's a failure then. It's like, to me, it's a success. We had a big impact. You know, you're, you're looking at what control of disease, though, right? Yeah. I mean, we're on the tree side. We don't we're looking for growth. Right. Or, you yeah. know, we're right. not necessarily we're not spraying it fully or to control some kind of, you know, leaf spot or anything like that. Well, I mean, or blight. We're just they would it's mainly used as a soil amendment. And when they sprayed the compost tea, did they put nutrients in the tea? I don't tea? know. I, I mean, See, I could, I could that's what they don't do the all the time. And you're not going to have any Im the only impact you're going to have to do using compost tea that hasn't had nutrients added in after you're done brewing it is going to be disease kind of impact because there's no nutrients left. The microbes ate them all. Mm -hmm. You're spraying a bunch of microbes. Trees don't grow on microbes above ground. You know, down in the ground, you can maybe help a little bit. And I hear that. I find that all the time. It's like, well, we put the, we put the nutrients in when we brewed the tea. They're all gone. Right. You know, so I just think. It really, has, I have to see what the test is to say it. And I'm not actually, you know, my point here is that I think there's potential. And I think that it might be useful to use something like provide because then you, at least you have now a benchmark. You know, you know you have the, the same microbes. It's easier to follow it. I don't think it's there, you know? I think the kind of the analogy I think of is probiotics with human, mm -hmm. you know, they sell you all these different mm -hmm. strains and mixes and proportions and no one really has it figured out yeah. in terms of probiotics, yeah, right. you know, mm -hmm. for your stomach. What, what's going to actually, what's actually helpful? I mean, there's some studies out there, but they normally they control for everything except like one thing. But then yet, you know, the products they sell you, it's just, I don't know. Yeah, but it's if you're not eating good food when you're taking probiotics, it's probably not going to work as well, right. you know? So that's kind of what I think about the tea. Anyways, enough about tea. Well, and then you have prebiotics, which would be leeks, which are the clay of your intestines. You know what I mean? It still has that... If you don't have that for them to colonize, then you're not, it doesn't matter. I put it in there, I guess, because I remember to say it. All of these biofungicides, you want to use them with rotations. If you use the same biofungicide over and over again, you're going to select for the organisms that are resistant to that, and it's, not, it's going to stop working. You know, and some, some, Diseases like the ones in the water mold family, like late blight, for top the cap CC, for top the cinnamome, which is the one that you guys have to worry about, those are incredibly dynamic. So if you're just hitting them with the same thing, they're going to find their way around it really fast. You have to constantly be surprising them and coming from another direction. I'd forgotten about one. We got a whole pile of them to look out back there, and one that I haven't used for a while that is just essential oils, clove oil, thyme oil, things like that. We, we see a lot of phytopter canker, and our main treatment is uh, phosphorus acid. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Uh, because it is it's broad spectrum, I don't think it's going to. I don't think there'll be much resistance against mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's so, a physical action. Yeah. yeah. Sporatech is another one that just is a different direction. Instead of trying to use life to fight it, now you're using essential oils, and so just by hitting with different things, you manage to get a better chance to get in control. You know, trichoderma. It is one tough fungus. I mean. It's kind of ironic. I buy trichoderma to use in the soil, and I'm terrified of it in my shiitake patch. You know, I mean, it's just like this thug in the shiitake patch and this hero in the garden. Right. You know, um, and it's it's the one that I got told I couldn't control um, fusarium without using some nasty chemicals, and I said I'm gonna try trichoderma and compost tea. They said it won't work. It totally worked. You know, wow. it just stopped it. And indeed, I out of curiosity, I left one infective tomato in to see if it was gonna spread or get worse, and that tomato never died. It never produced, really. It was hit too hard. So that's just fusarium? Just fusarium. 
Will it do Pythium and Phytophthora? I would not be surprised if it didn't have a, have a, a big... So impact. most of the wet rods. Yeah, I think basically diversity, like the story, you know, that we had, a, we had um, Phytophthora in the garden here, and our extension agent like came out and said, looks like Phytophthora, but they should have all died in a week, and you've had them slowly dying over the entire summer. So I don't think it is, and called me back and said, bad news and good news. And I said, well, what's the good news first? He said, you must have incredibly diverse soil. Your soil must be amazing. Bad news, you have Phytophthora but it should have totally wiped everything out. So I think soil diversity, and that's why I was saying to somebody earlier, grafting, because you graft, you now have much bigger roots that are pumping way more exudates out, which is creating more diversity. And so it's the kind, and that's why the T probably had some effect, because the T is just more diversity. Trichoderma is the heavy hitter, but the Fusarium not only has to survive this parasitic fungi that wants to eat it, it's also got to now compete. You know, and so the combination is, it puts a hurt on it, you know, it worked pretty well for us anyways. Actinovate, you know, I've only used Actinovate as a dip for like when you're planting. I haven't used it, I just didn't pay attention, to tell you the truth. But people use it as a spray and I think it's pretty effective for things like late blight. So I'm going to play with that more, you know. Um, and I'm not really going to talk about the suppliers, I think they're all pretty good. Um, and Basically, I didn't, don't think I put fifth season there, but fifth season probably has it too. And I think I've gotten it there. Regalia. Regalia is made from giant knotweed. It works by causing the plant to increase its phenol levels. So you want to be putting that on early. Not when the late blight shows up. That's not going to work, right? You want to be basically getting the plant to be inhospitable. So sometime, we usually start sometime in June, early June, because then we know. It used to be we wouldn't start till late July, but now we see late blight sometimes in early July you know, because of changing weather. So we go with it sooner. And we think it's a piece of the control. You know, we, we rotate it with double nickel. Double nickel, unfortunately, is not for the main thing. We're, the main thing we spray fungicides for is tomatoes, you know. We sometimes use it for other things, most likely downy mildew on cucurbit, you know. Um, those are the two that we really worry about and that we do our spraying for. We don't like to spray. We try not to spray. Have you ever heard of the IR4 project? No, I haven't. Okay, and it's pretty... I can tell you more about it later, but it's basically where they have, they're looking for effectiveness mm -hmm. of all these things you mentioned, mm -hmm. and they're constantly testing things and mm -hmm. uh, updating their database. Mm -hmm. I think it's put out by Oregon, uh -huh. Oregon State, or uh -huh. someone, but I, it's normally the first thing I go to. Oregon State's got a great series of webinars on stuff to use in an e an e um, control channel, YouTube channel, or something like that. Um, and that's where, you know, there's some new things I just learned about the agrophage and the pre-stop I hadn't known about. And I learned that from one of their webinars. And it's, you know, it's with all this. Okay, so favorite example, Bacillus subtilis, right? I'm sitting in a workshop with Richard Boylan. And there's this academic up there. And she's telling us what works and doesn't work. And she goes, Bacillus subtilis doesn't work for powdery mildew. And I turn to Richard. And he turns to me. And we both say at the same time, worked for me. You know, and then... We shut up and we let her say the rest of her stuff and then it's over and we then go check in. I said, so did you just spray that? And he said, no, I used seaweed and fish because I always do. If I'm going to spray, I'm going to give a feed and the fish is going to help it to last, you know. And I get, I did the same thing, you know. And then I go up and tell her that and she said, oh, we only did the serenade. You know, and it's like, okay, you know. <laughs> you know. So it's not necessarily that these things don't work, but maybe you want to do every best practice you can, you know. Well, and you got to put serenade on regularly. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Got... I started up our, our whole plant health care program. It didn't even exist. But basically, I was working with a master arborist that was spraying things like um, chlorothalonil and mm -hmm. just some right. stuff. I didn't want it. Like, I'll be, I'm spraying. Nasty I didn't want to be right, covered in this stuff. But exactly. actually, this is the one I settled on. It's mm -hmm. actually, we use uh, seas or serenade. They're both mm -hmm. the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then we combine it with uh, cop copper. Mm -hmm. octanoinate mm -hmm. um and we see a lot of dogwood anthracnose yep and we'll use it on that and we see a lot of rhizosphera needle casts on our spruce mm -hmm. and that's that's our program mm -hmm. that's what we're using right now yeah i mean i find it highly effective on early blight you know? but it does have to be sprayed it's really blight, but early blight you know mm -hmm. that's right. the trade-off is you have to do it more frequently right. then you know i could go in there and sp spray chlorothalonil or you know something else uh, Sure, but mm -hmm. I'd rather just spray more frequently and not be covered in the mist of carcinogens. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's you know 
So I found it useful, not all, it's kind of erratic. You know, there are years when I just can't get a grip on, I mean. What kind of is the other one they would use? Them? The, the, well, I talked about that one really bad early, early blight year, then we had a really bad early blight, here, blight year here too, I think it was 2011. It's just, once again, it's the weather. You know, it's just the kind of weather and it's perfect for early blight. It's not good for late blight because it's warmer, but we couldn't get a grip and we ended up using copper. And so the serenade, no matter how many times we sprayed it, just wouldn't do it. And that's, sometimes it just, it just overwhelms what you're using and you got to go to something else, you know? It's, with the serenade, it's much more important to get it on board before it shows up. Right. Totally. Once it's there, it's tough. I mean, you're, it's not really going to do anything. No, it's not a rescue tree. I've actually gotten it to work. Putting, putting it on right before that vulnerability period and during vulnerability periods. Mm -hmm. I've gotten it to work on seedlings that had just gone out and suddenly it's early blight shows up on it. Mm -hmm. And at that stage, it worked. It, worked. it gave me, it, it stopped it and it didn't come back. And I had, I had the right spacing, otherwise I did the other stuff that I needed to do and it worked. So I think it's worth trying, you know? And I think it's worth trying in some situations in conjunction with copper. I taught Wade at Troy's Greenhouse in 2003, like this terrible year, and he was trying to save his heirloom tomato seed that he grows, and the only ones that live were the ones with the serenade that I gave him. He was, what was that? And he's the person that got the company to put the, make the consumer sizes, because he was breaking it down and selling it to people because he wanted people to buy it. He eventually got it so that in Burnsville was probably the highest, the highest concentration of serenade buyers in the country, I bet. There'd be people walking out with Roundup on one shoulder, serenade on the other. Yeah. You go, I just saw these guys, these rednecks walking out with a 50 pound bag of serenade over their shoulder. And I'm like, buddy, the other one, you, know? Is, you know, even more expensive. You know, mm -hmm. they, it's, I think they only sell them like gallon sizes. Mm -hmm. But he always said, he just told people outright, use it with copper. That was his, he wasn't taking any chances. You know, I would wait and see if I needed the copper. I have a different feeling about the copper, you know. Okay, double nickel functions as a leaf colonizer. And actually I had a sheet there that talked about what some of these diseases worked on and I should just mention because some of them it's pretty important what they work what they what they're effective on you know for me anyways because there are some diseases I worry more frankly like I said really the only two diseases I really worry about three early blight in the wrong year but otherwise late blight and downy mildew you know I mean powdery mildew lots of these things work on it there's lots of ways to deal with it but those guys they scare me, you know. They get it. They get us on it fast, you know. And double nickel worked for pottery. Um, well, actually, last year I learned. To, I learned, and it worked for Altenaria. Last year I learned to be afraid of a new one, and that was bacteri bacterial spot or speck. We got tore up by that last year, and all around here people got tore up by it. And I haven't had a problem with that on anything but peppers once at. Highland Lake, and I hit it really early with copper and stopped it cold, you know. But down here, we just didn't get on it fast enough, and we couldn't get a grip on it. And I, I went to a tomato workshop, and that was the main, the main problem. And, and you say spot R spec, because even the pathologist has a hard time telling which one it is, you know. So the fact that double nickel helps that, double nickel works as a colonizer. Um, but it also can have some effect on things like pythium that actually where it's actually doing more than colonizing, it's also attacking it, you know? So it's not as effective as the, um, for me, because of the things that it works on, as regalia. The regalia has, it covers more of the spectrum of problems I have, but it's worth using. You know, we, we put it into the mix, you know? And then this new one here, agrophage, I like that because it's effective on bacteria, and so it's effective on that bacterial spot and spec. I'm kind of getting ready for that now. Now that we got hit once, if it comes again, I'm not gonna let it do what it did to us last year. I mean, last year, we had a grip on late blight and we got hammered by this thing that I don't usually even worry about. So now, is it gonna show up again? I don't know, things are changing, you know? We don't have the same weather and we have different diseases. So I have to be ready for that. Pre-stop, that's a brand new one to me, glyocladium. And then that last one, I don't even know if I spelled it right. But anyways, that one there functions as a leaf colonizer, but also, uses chitinase and gluconase to attack the cell walls of the pathogens. That sounds like a pretty powerful one. And that one's listed for both late blight, early blight, and downy mildew. So that, that's the trifecta for me, boy. If I hit all those, you know, I think it even, if I look at this, I think it also um, takes out um, 
the, the bacterial specks and spots too. So it's really pretty, you know, pretty useful, you know. And then I, these guys here I have less written because I forgot about them until I got down here and looked at the containers, you know. Sonata, it's listed for the worst for us, which is downy mildew and late blight. And so we rotate that with Serenade. And then, like I said, Sporatec is listed for all kinds of things. It's really kind of mechanical, you know, it's this aromatic oil. And we'll use that as an occasional come in and just change it up kind of thing. You know, what I don't have on here is Oxidate, which we've kind of stopped using because... Uh, Michael Phillips was here when he was here talking about apples. He said they'd done research and saw that they, it was cleaning the leaves so thoroughly that they were having trouble re recolonizing them, and the plants were actually less able to resist. Um, with the compost tea, that wasn't a problem for me. You know, it worked fine, and I could I could spray it in the morning and come back and put the tea on at night, and I was having complete control. You know, but then again, it might have just been the tea because when I pulled the um, Oxidate, because of the weather, I still had control. And how does Oxidate help? What does it do? Oxidate is hydrogen dioxide, not peroxide, hydrogen dioxide. It works the same way. Just basically, you know, it aerates things to death. You know, it kind of burns the stuff. It's just like so much oxygen that the stuff dies. You know, so it's, it's a great steroid that just like nothing can survive it. You know, where I find it useful, it's obviously not a biological, so it's not even part of the subject, but I find it useful in the years where it won't stop raining. You know, where 2003 was like that. I'd get out, I'd spray the serenade. I'd be all done spraying. You know, I had a lot of tomatoes. There was a lot of spraying. It would start raining, you know? Yeah. And so then I'd go back out later. I'd spray the serenade. It would start raining again. I mean, there were 10 days where it rained like every couple of hours. I just didn't go out there anymore. I couldn't stand to look at it. Lo and behold, the serenade kept my plants alive. All my big fruit was, you know, sick, but it kept them alive. Had I had Oxidate, I could have gone out there in that hour and knock that stuff way back, you know? And then when I came finally in with the serenade, after all that rain stopped, I might have had some fruit, some big fruit. All I ended up with was not very tasty sun golds because there weren't very many leaves either, you know? But I had the only tomatoes, once again, at market, and people were willing to spend my normal price, you know, for, I mean, a bad sun gold is still a decent tasting tomato, you know? But that's all there was in that year. It was just a terrible year. Um, that's it for those. Let's go to the find the organism.